I'm going to outline um, how a random collecting of stories had, has led to the discovery of a piece of Mount Holly Springs history. Uh, the organization that, that I belong to besides the Historical Society is Mount Tabor Preservation Project. And it came about as a result from Heart and Soul, um, which is an organization that is uh, collecting stories and promotes grassroots, grassroots um, efforts from just the average people. Um, so I have uh, presented by Dr. Lindsay Varner because Lindsay is the one that basically started Mount Tabor Preservation Project and basically informed us, the, the folks that have lived in that area and basically attended the church, that it was a piece of history. To us, we cared about it, we thought it was important to us, but we had no idea that anyone else would be interested um, in an old church and a rundown cemetery. So I keep Lindsay's name there because um, she is a board member of Mount Tabor Preservation Project. We are now a 501c3, thanks to the Cumberland County Historical Society, who sort of shepherded, shepherded us um, through that process, and were they were our fiscal sponsor uh, until we were able to become a 501c3. So why don't we get started? It all started with a story. And what you see here are the Gumby sisters. Um, it started with their story, and the story collector um, was Pam Steele. And basically, Pam was collecting stories about Mount Holly Springs from in individuals, and she was told that perhaps she um, might want to collect a story from the Gumby sisters. There were three sisters, even though you only see two here. One was in poor health. That sister was Ethel, and basically Ethel was the Sunday school teacher. And you'll hear about Ethel um, throughout this program, either from me or you're going to see a video that was done by the Gordon Family Trust, who basically started the Heart and Soul Movement. But this is Ethel, I'm sorry, this is Harriet, and this is Edna. And Harriet is the one that it was the talker. She was the one that talked about when they were collecting the stories about, they, they came to collect a story about growing up in Mount Holly that Pam reminded me last week that what they walked away with was a story about a legacy, a family legacy. When I look at this and I remember talking to the sisters and also their mother, I forget that they are the granddaughters of a Civil War veteran. The Civil War was 158 years ago and when I think of growing up and listening to them and listening to their mother. I had no idea that, a, that, that they had a grandfather, their grandfather, fought in the Civil War. And we were very lucky to be able to collect those stories and have those stories from not only the sisters, but other members of the family that are now in the Gardner G uh, Digital Library uh, here at Cumberland County Historical Society. So it all started with a story. And what I'm going to tell you is that we're going to do a video, and because I'm challenged technically, <laughs> Kara's going to start the video that was uh, created by Heart and Soul and the Orton Foundation that sort of encompasses what collecting the story and the legacy means. And this was rolled out not only to this area, but this has been presented all, all across the country. where we're looking at the Gumby legacy, you could tell um, from what you just watched, is that a lot of people telling the Gumby legacy also brought back the collecting of stories from Mount Holly Springs in general, the way it used to be, the lost buildings, um, things that have changed, but the people that are still there remember what they had before, and the gathering of the stories and the promoting of Mount Tabor and the nearby cemetery only adds to the story uh, of the small town. And, and basically that's um, the foundation. We, uh, you'll hear me talk about or use the word foundation a lot. Um, I think that's the foundation of, of heart and soul in collecting stories. It's also the foundation of the church. Um, we just finished, and you'll see uh, pictures, we just finished the first 
first page of the restoration for the church, and it was the foundation. And we think that's pretty poetic because it was the foundation of that community during the 1800s. It was the foundation of a lot of families that attended that church, and it's, and it's the first thing that we're doing to restore the building. So let's get started. Again, I, I can't emphasize enough, this is Harriet Gumby, and I will show you this clock. This is the day that we moved everything out of the church and we put it into the trailer that was donated by um, the, I say, Smith Ward family, because half are Wards, half are Smiths. And, and I show this picture, oops, I told you I was challenged. <laughs> and I'll show you this picture, you'll see it later on. Um, talking about, uh, stories and collecting stories. I'm very lucky, I grew up in Mount Holly. I, I moved away and spent 30, over 30 years outside Philadelphia in the Philadelphia area. But when I moved back, I have a group of friends that I've known, most of them since first grade. <laughs> and so we get together periodically and some of them are in the room, all of them are in the room today. Um, but when this picture came out, I received a call from um, Joni and Jay McBride saying, uh, we want to restore the, the clock. Uh, and so you're going to see later on in the presentation, um, you're going to see the before and after. And that clock is in, this, in the museum on the second floor here. Um, it's been donated because at the time that the restoration occurred, there wasn't an owner. We didn't know what was gonna happen to any of the items in the church. Um, and, and the remaining trustee family, which were the Gumby sisters, um, turned it over to the Historical Society for safekeeping and it couldn't be in a better place. This is, these are the old pews, guys. And this is a descendant of Elias and also a former congregant. That's Larry Foster, and of course that's me. And we're sitting there, not that we're not working. We were just reminiscing on the last time we sat in those, in, in those pews and listened to service. There was not a, in our time, there was not a Sunday service every Sunday. It was a rotating minister, and so he would come every second or third week, but you did have Sunday school, as you heard Tom Gumby say, um, and you heard me talk about in the beginning, you had Sunday school every single Sunday, and you put on your fine Sunday clothes, you put on your good Sunday shoes, and you went to Sunday school, and we sat in those benches, and we were just reminiscing. Um, the service was, if you had Sunday service, it was usually two or three hours long, and so that's what we were talking about. <laughs> Um, I wanted to point out that we've been very lucky. Um, we've been very lucky that we've had a lot of folks help us. Uh, this is the company that moved all of our archives into uh, storage at Trendle Road, and that's where they remain until the building is finished. I wanted to give you some history. Um, the church uh, itself is the oldest AME, and that's African Methodist Episcopal, easily rolled off the tongue. Zion Church, and there is a difference between AME and AME Zion. I'm Zion, and all I know is that there's a difference, and, and, and the older people will tell you what the difference is. It won't be me. Um, uh, but it's the oldest AME Zion Church law constructed in Cumberland County, so I am told. And um, it's one and a half stories. Uh, it's log and chinking on the first floor and the half story is just basically log and it's covered in uh, cladding. The logs are pine and the cladding is also pine. The size of it is 37 by 24. That's the size of the lot and the church takes up 50% of that lot. Um, there is, it's, it's just the, the land that it's on is the only land that it has, so there isn't really any parking. So after we're done with our uh, restoration process, the next step will be looking for uh, parking on either side. We have promises, um, and, and we hope we, want, we get them, um, but the parking on either side, and we do have part of our architectural design does have a parking lot design on it. Uh, let me see. One other thing I wanted to tell you as far as the history of the Mountain Street and Cedar Street 
is the fact that um, there is another cemetery. Uh, there is Mount Tabor, there is a nearby cemetery that's on Cedar Street. It's referred to as the Colored Cemetery. Um, but there is another family cemetery on Johnson Family Land that is older than the cemetery that's on Cedar Street. And I'll show you a picture, and it's one of the few pictures that we have of anyone um, on Cedar or Mountain Street uh, later on in the presentation. Aha, this is the clock. So as we saw, this was the clock when it came out of the church, and this is Jay and Jen when it was finished. And I will tell you that um, I did vacuum the clock before Jay and Joan picked it up. Uh, but when we took it to uh, the repair, or the gentleman that was going to work on it, and I think he's on Bonnie Park Road? I'm not sure. Burn House. Burn House Road. Okay. Um, when he opened it, there was a mouse nest. So, you know, hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up. Well, this was hickory dickory dock, the clock that mouse was living in the clock. Um, so we had a mouse nest in it. And, and again, I can't tell you how kind people have been because what he charged us was hardly anything to do, to do the clock. Um, you can wind it and it will sound. Um, one of the neighbors uh, of Jay and Joni uh, said, oh, I can fix that door because it was missing, it was missing a door, as you can see right here. Um, and the, the hole was, I think, up in there. Um, he fixed that, and then when we were growing up, there was a supermarket. There was Arnold's Supermarket, which a lot of people worked in, and there was also Enders, and the Enders um, family had a son, and I, I cannot remember what his name was. I, I will refer to them as Mr. Ender. I don't know, was it Bobby Jenner? Bobby Ender. He painted this for us. So I, I, this is the connection that you have when you're growing up in Mount Holly, and that connection continues. He painted that. Um, he heard about the clock, and I think he reached out to Joan and Jay, and, and he painted the face. So there were many hands that helped restore this clock. And as I said, you'll be able to see it upstairs in our wonderful museum. And this picture that you see here is, I found this in my mother's album one day, one uh, Christmas when I was waiting for my slow brother to get there to open presents. And, and I found this, and it, this picture was taken um, right before the church closed. And these are the chairs, uh, and these are the chairs now that again are upstairs in the museum. Two, two of them have been restored again, Jay and Joni were instrumental in doing that, and, and another friend that went to school with us in first grade was Candy, um, and she showed us, um, we didn't know what was the original fabric on the original chairs, and she gave us a lesson that you strike a match, you light it to the fabric, but if it smells like hair, it was mohair. Voila. <laughs> but we didn't put mohair back on because we can't afford it. Uh, but anyway, the chairs, one of them remains the way it was so that there's a comparison, but the other chairs are upstairs again in the museum. And um, I always tell this story. You see this picture right here? This is a picture of Jesus. No matter where you sat in the sanctuary, those eyes would follow you. So sometimes, for me, going to church for three hours can get a little boring. So you would move, maybe move, and just test the eyes, and they did. They followed him. And this was a picture of a bishop. I don't know which bishop, but I will tell you that when we went into the church, some of the items that were missing was the picture of Jesus and the picture of bishop, the bishop. And also there was a charter on the wall um, that was very old that talked about the establishment of that particular um, church, and that was missing. There were also oil lamps missing. Oil lamps can be replaced um, the picture of Jesus, um, I tell this whenever we do any presentation, is that um, we hope that someday um, it'll come back, no questions asked. I don't know what they would be doing with the picture of Jesus. This is what I uh, was talking about when I said that we have another cemetery that's in the Mountain Street, Cedar Street area. It's uh, Larry Foster and his family own the property. Uh, he is a descendant of a Johnson. And this is um, 
a metal marker that is in the cemetery. Um, we have a lot of work to do as far as finding out who everyone is in that cemetery, but we have been very lucky because Larry was cleaning out a family, the family home um, right before he was uh, fixing it up, and he found a picture. We called her, the, the Fosters and the Gumbies, called, she was Betty Johnson, but they called her Aunt Betty, so I called her Aunt Betty. Um, and he found a picture of mm -hmm. Aunt Betty. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're yes. terribly pained to have that. Um, and it's one of the few things that, uh, pictures that we have we, of, of anyone uh, from the 1800s. <coughs> one of the other stories that came out um, across the street there is a residence and they found a cemetery. I mean, they found a headstone in, jammed up under the coal bin and the name on the headstone is Reuben Baxter. And during one of our tours that we had last year, Randy Watts um, sent me this and said, because I told him we were looking, we couldn't find where he was buried, if this is the right headstone, is he in the yard? Because it is not unusual in the past to have people buried in the yards. Um, so we didn't know. And he sent me this with a notation that this is an alternative spelling, which I am the master of alternative spelling. <laughs> um, this is alternative spelling for, for Braxton, but we still haven't been able to um, to find where he is. We know we have his headstone, they donated to it to us, and again, we have a story about a family that was concerned about their legacy, but as we go along, we're collecting more stories, more mysteries, We and, and we hope by the time this, the, and I talked to Kara about this, by the time we finish, we hope that, finish the restoration of the church, um, we hope that we'll be able to sit down and all of the still existing mysteries and questions that we'll be able to sit down and do research and be able to share um, when we have our tours or when we do presentations like this. <coughs> Mount Holly Springs Borough, we're, we were very lucky. Mount Holly Springs, when we started this in 2016, um, we just started as a grassroots group going in and cleaning out the church and, and cleaning the cemetery. We didn't know who the owner was. And we also knew that we needed money to do the restoration and do work. We needed grants. You can't write a grant if the building or the property isn't owned by someone. So between 2016 and 2019, that's the length of time it took for us um, to get the property deeded over to the borough of Mount Holly Springs. So we were very grateful that they did that. And as a result, we've been partnering with them um, we write the grants, they help us monitor the grants and, and make sure that the grants are closed out properly. And it's a very good relationship and we couldn't thank them uh, enough for helping us. This is a logo and this was done by um, Lindsay Varner's husband, Chris. He did it in an hour. We, we came into her office to meet on something else and it was hanging on the wall and I said, what is that? She said, oh, Chris did that. It took him about an hour. And I said, can we have that? <laughs> and she said, sure, I'm sure he won't mind. And so what this has become is our logo. Um, this and, and you'll see a lot of this. We have, uh, as a fundraiser, we have ornaments where we have, uh, wooden ornaments where we have this. And it's, um, it, it's very near and dear to us. Uh, and it looks, because the trees that are in front of this building are no longer there, but um, it, this is what the building looks like for those of you who haven't seen it. Part of collecting the story from the, from the Gumby sisters, um, they were collecting the story and Harriet um, started talking about the legacy of her family and being concerned because they were getting older and that their grandfather had fought in the Civil War and he had built a church and he, they were concerned that all of that would go away when they weren't here anymore. And so she took Lindsay and Pam to the back window and said, there's the church. And so Lindsay's like, where's the church? <laughs> so that's, that's what the side of the church looked like um, in 2016 when they first gathered the story. 
This is what it looked like in the front. And you know those vines that are there? That's poison ivy. <laughs> and we have some vines that are as thick as my arm. Um, but that's what it looked like, the tall grass. And that's after, because the, um, the door had been nailed shut. So they pried the window. They lifted Pam through the window. And um, she went in and pried the door open. Muscles. <laughs> and, and they went in, and, and basically it was like a time capsule. There were, um, there were books, and pew, there were uh, handles on the pews, and it was just like a time capsule that the door was locked and people just walked away. This is the oldest picture we have, and um, this is uh, given to us uh, by the Gumby uh, family. Uh, Roslyn um, Gumby Bachman um, had this. She had done two books, uh, and I'll talk about her a little bit later because she's no longer with us. And that's, the, that's another reason why collecting the stories and, and putting them in a place like the Gardner Digital Library is important because once people go and are gone, I can't tell you how many times um, when we're at a board meeting and we're just talking among ourselves, we're like, oh, we'll have to, and there's nobody to ask, not it. So the importance of collecting those stories and making sure um, that, that there is a record of them and it will be an ongoing record. Um, this is one of the only original pictures and um, Ralston couldn't remember where it came from. She just remembers that it was given to her father and that's um, what the building looked like years and years ago. That's what it looked like right when it closed around 1970. Um, that white door, uh, yeah, it's closed in 1970. It stopped um, having services in 1970 and it's said abandoned until 2016. So this is basically what it looked like uh, at that particular point in time. That is not the original door. That is a stronger uh, door, and that's the door that's on there right now. But that will be replaced because we do have the original door in storage. This is lovely. Um, this is a drone picture um, that Tim Curtis had taken for us. He was very kind, um, and he took this. Uh, this is when our tarps were pretty nice. Um, let me tell you, tarps don't last longer than, that. It, they don't last as long as they should considering how hard they are to put up. Um, so, um, but this is a picture that we're very proud of and um, I thank um, Tim for, for taking the time to take this picture. This is what the church looks like now. Um, as you can see, it's, it's been winterized. This is part of the restoration. Um, and. Uh, it's covered in plastic, and this was part of our first phase, winterizing it and then working on the, on the foundation. We also have interpretive signs. South Mountain Partnership, uh, we received a grant from them to not only um, do the uh, work on the foundation, but also to do interpretive signs. So we have three interpretive signs temporarily put at the church because, as I stated before, there's not a lot of land around the church, so we put them temporarily. The owner of that property, which is a descendant of Elias Parker, said we could put them temporarily there so they wouldn't have any construction uh, damage. Um, but those are uh, uh, three historical signs that if you visit our church, you'll be able to get the history. Um, and these are board members that uh, took a Saturday and dug the holes. I will tell you that this is the foundation. And I point this out because this is a story. I don't know what the story is going to be, but it will be interesting. This is below ground, and it's a brownstone. And we can't figure out where that came as part of the corner of the foundation. But I will tell you that we put in the two signs, and when we got to this third one, you can see it sitting a little higher. There was a stone about that big that we couldn't get out, so we just put it there and said it'll, it'll add to the story when we're doing tours. <laughs> but when we were talking to the contractor, um, one of our board members, uh, Chuck Stoddard, said, um, what if we don't have enough stones for the foundation? And I said to my husband, Chuck wants to know, what if we don't have enough stones? He said, tell him to dig a hole. <laughs> <laughs> This, I, before, um, um, before we cleared everything out, I, I, this is what it looked like. And um, we 
did some rearranging, and I can see I need work to rearrange this a little bit, but this will uh, show you uh, when Pam went in. This is basically the chairs, the missing picture of Jesus up here. Um, and this is, these are the pews, and we have all of this. We have uh, some of this material, these are the hymnals, and this was recently taken. This is the attic. I've never been to the attic. When I was little, I started going to this church in the 50s. Um, and I was always told not to go upstairs, so I never did. I'm, I, and I think I'm the only kid in the neighborhood that didn't. That <laughs> but this is the upstairs, and I can hardly wait until the restoration is finished so I can go upstairs. These are some pictures, original pictures, of what it looked like after some of the vegetation was taken, taken off. But you can still see the vines. These are vines. Some, is maple, some are maple, but I will tell you, some, these hairy things right here, that's blue and I. This is the back of the church, and up here we have big woodpecker holes from, and I know I'm saying it, it's either pileated or pileated, but we have the, we're very blessed, we have those in our woods, and, and you hear them more often than you see them, but it's a joy. These are more pictures. I will point this out to you. We have knob and tube in the ceiling. We never had electricity from the time, from the 50s until the time it closed. So there is a theory that perhaps, although the foundation is original, um, that maybe the building was a relocation from another place. And we have been told that. And at the time when the gentleman mentioned it, I was like, but you know, I'm beginning to think maybe he was right. Um, what I wanted to show you here. This is a re recent picture. Um, to do the foundation, they had to take up the floor boards. So the floor boards were taken up and numbered and bundled. And these are the floor joists, which I think, based on the fact that it was built circa 1878, that's what the deed says, 1878, that the property was bought for $17. Um, and it was, uh, sold to three trustees and to the new minister. And when you, and when you think that it's set for almost 50 years, these are the uh, floor joists, and we will be able to use a whole lot of these. They, they are in really good shape. One of the other stories that we'll talk about we have are nature stories. In our attic for about three years, we had black vultures. And they are a protected species and they don't need a nest to lay an egg, and they eat rotten food, and they spit rotten food at you as a protection. So we had, because they're protected, we had, they had lived there for at least three years. Um, we had to wait until the last uh, eggs hatched, uh, get a special permit from the game commission. We had to have the game commission there. Um, and we had hazmat suits uh, for Lindsay Varner and for Julia Chan, and then the um, game commission person didn't need, um, she said, and guess what happened to her? <laughs> she didn't need a hazmat suit, but boy was she stinking later on. <laughs> so anyway, um, they don't need a nest. You can put their eggs, they lay their eggs, flat on a ground or on a surface. So basically, um, Julia Chan donated a doghouse, and um, they climbed up a ladder in the hazmat suits, moved uh, the babies. I think there were two. I'm not sure. It wasn't my favorite thing, did it? Um, and they moved the babies into the dog into the doghouse, and Julia provided a chicken from her farm, a rotten chicken, because uh, I was going to go out and buy one. And she said, no, I have one. Um, and they did well. And we continue to have them in the neighborhood, but we have we have to seal up the church because, I mean, it's not healthy. And if we're bringing people in, we don't want you to have to breathe that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> we'll talk about headstones. And in case you guys haven't seen in the back, um, I have a row of headstones. One of the things that we're pr most proud, and the thing that basically got me really excited about this project, was when Lindsay Varner walked up to me during. I roll out of some information on Mount Tabor and said, you know, you have seven SUSCT troops buried in your cemetery. 
Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm not a historian. I'm a banker. So I was thinking, FDIC. Yes. <laughs> and so finally I said, Lindsay, I'll get to it eventually, but how about telling me what that means? And she said, they fought in the Civil War. And she said, U.S. colored troops. And I'm like, oh, they fought in the Civil War? We have seven? She said, you have seven buried in that cemetery. Guys, I lived there all my life. Since 1951, I was two years old when my parents moved there. I never knew that. And neither did most of the kids that lived there. We did not know that. So that was, I think I said, I'm all in after she told me that. And, and that's the thing because when you think, at least for me, when you think that um, in a little town, Mount Holly proper, because the population is bigger if you add other zip codes, but for our little, one little Mount Holly proper, there's about 2,000 people. When you think about that, and there are seven USC teachers buried in the cemetery there, I think that's something that we should be talking about. Um, there are other Civil War veterans buried in the other cemetery, but guys, that's not my story today. This is my story today. But there is a lot of history in Mount Holly. And the goal, and especially with the grant process, one of our grants is for marketing and tourism. Um, the goal is to bring people into Mount Holly, to eat in our restaurants, to shop in our stores, eventually to sleep in our town, but we have bed and breakfasts nearby, and have people come into our town and hear our stories, hear about the legacy story and other stories, and, and basically um, put Mount Holly, as far as history is concerned, on the map. So I said there are pictures of headstones in the back, that's the first phase of cleaning. I will tell you that what we use to clean them is a D2, and as it ages, the stones get cleaner. So the pictures you have back there are what it was after the first uh, cleaning. If you look at the back, you'll see what it looked like originally, and you also get a bio of the, um, the, the Civil War veteran. Um, but this is, this is what the headstone looked like before. And this was the marker, and the markers weren't the correct markers next to the headstones, but David went to the Veterans Administration, provided the name of our veterans, they had them on record, and they gave him new rupees. And this is what the headstone looks like now. And we were very lucky, part of one of the programs that we rolled out. Um, reads across America every second week in December for three years. We have had um, a placement of Christmas trees uh, on our headstones. But I wanted to show you that because um, some of the things, some of the payback we do at the historical societies, we have been known to clean headstones. <laughs> and um, we just did a project on Bonnie Brook Road um, not too long ago. Uh, so, but you can see this, this, it, it, this even looks better now than when you look in the back. This is the Gumby family. Um, this, oops, here we go. This is the Gumby family, Gumby family, Gumby, Gumby. This is the Howard family, London family, and this is the oldest headstone we have in that cemetery. It's 1888. Her name is Ida Scott. She lived on Mill Street, so not every African American lived on Mount or Cedar Street. There were other places in Mount Holly that they lived. But Ida lived on Mill Street. She died at 16, and she died of influenza, which I think is based on what we've gone through recently. It just harkens back to sometimes things, they may be called different things, but they're still out there. And that is the whole oldest headstone that we have. I put this headstone on because this is the Howards, and I grew up in a house that is, does have a plaque, and we have four houses that have Cumberland County a Register of Historic Place plaques. My house that I grew up in, it's called the Redmond House, Pam Stills House, the library, and Mount Tabor. And this family lived in the house that I grew up in for 41 years, and they paid $14 a month for <laughs> and my parents bought the house for $2,500 in 1951. <laughs> That's a little personal history. Um, this headstone is my favorite one. This is what it looked like before. And you saw these folks uh, on the um, 
video that was taken from um, the Orton, by the Orton Family Trust. This is three generations, and they were basically, uh, through ancestry, looking for their great-grandfather. And they knew he was buried in a cemetery in Mount Holly Springs, and they finally contacted, after going a number of places, to, to the wrong place. They called the Historical Society, and somebody gave him to Lindsay. And Lizzie said, I know exactly where he's buried and we're doing a program next weekend. We would love to have you. And so they came and they found their grandfather. Oh gosh, almost, almost said a dirty word. Actually. <laughs> Actually. So this is Henry S. Ward. And when you see his, his headstone back on the picture, you'll be able, it's the prettiest headstone. Uh, we did a preservation PA presentation and they did it because of COVID, and it was online. And I was, pat I must have been patting the headstone. My brother texted me and said, stop patting that headstone. What's wrong with you? But it's so pretty when you see it. It's like, really pretty. This is what the cemetery um, looked like after we had done some work in it because it wasn't always that neat. And somebody in here told me that they know Josie and Jody Smith. That's just this holy mackerel. <laughs> this is, just, this is where the twins grew up. Um, I, don't, I can't remember, but it was somebody I just talked to today. Um, again, these are the headstones of our Civil War veterans, and that's what they look like. This is the headstone. We have an unknown person. We have a story of a, a young man in his 20s. They uh, said that he was mulatto. He was jumping from one train to the other, and he slipped. He died. Um, he had a writing tablet in his pocket, so we knew he could read and write. Uh, and it was from uh, Mecklenburg. And they went back to that stationery store. Nobody knew who he was. And if nobody claimed him, he was going to be buried um, in the pulpit's grave. And I always thought, isn't it wonderful that the people on Cedar Street step forward and took him to bury him. One night I woke up and I said, I wonder if we were paupers filled. Maybe that's why. So you never know. I was thinking one thing, but you never really know um, what the true story is. But this is an unknown person, and he is now being taken care of by, by Mount Tabor Preservation Project and the borough of Mount Holly Springs. As I said, um, the borough of Mount Holly Springs um, owns the cemetery. As a result, we got a grant from South Mountain Partnership, and this is just an example um, of the interpretive signs at the cemetery. You saw the other three. And this is another project that came out of the Earth Science Department at Dickinson College. We only have 15 headstones, but we have 60 graves. And Dickinson College came and did ground penetrating radar, found all of the square anomalies and this is part of our sign. Any, so, any square that is outlined in blue and has red inside is a body. And what we did is we went through a program where we put solar lights, flush ground solar lights, on all of the graves so that now everybody has a headstone. So at night there's a soft glow and you can see where everybody's buried. I will tell you, it is a wonderful concept that is hard to maintain because in the summer the grass wants to grow over those. But we, we do a good job. But we do a good job, um, but we always lose count because when we go out to count to make sure we have all of them, we start talking about something and we lose track. That's what happens. But I, we, and, um, back. Uh, this basically is a list of our Civil War veterans. This shows you a 1960s picture of Henry Ward's headstone, and then this shows you a current picture. This is one of the headstones when we tell the story of our veterans that captures the interest of a lot of people. This is the, and this is a new headstone. This was um, installed, his original headstone is directly behind him, uh, but this was installed by uh, Tony Zizzi. Uh, who commissioned the Veteran Administration because you couldn't read the original headstone, and he and his brother came out and installed a brand new headstone. But this is, we don't have documentation to support the church or a lot of the cemetery. But what we have, we found an obituary for Richard Jordan that said that he was born in Macon, Georgia. He was brought, it says he was, he followed his Confederate officer who was his owner to Gettysburg. 
at Gettysburg, he managed to escape and he found his way to Holly, where he later joined the Union Army. He was discharged from the Union Army. He returned to Mount Holly and it gave a list of his family. It said he was a proud, a proud member of the GAR, which is the Grand Army of the Republic, and it listed his children. And it said that he was an active member in the church. So not everyone that's buried in that cemetery, and we call it the Cedar Street Cemetery, but if you go to find a grave, it's listed as the Colored Cemetery in Mount Holly Springs. We call it the Cedar Street Cemetery, um, but, um, that's his obituary. I will tell you that Randy Watts, who did one of our tours, and he's been sending me things ever since, it's just a blessing, um, basically um, sent me an article that, that said um, that it took him, the obituary says he quickly found his way to Mount Holly. It took him seven months, which sort of makes sense because how do you get from Gettysburg to Mount Holly? But it took him seven months. And we know that the Battle of Gettysburg was sort of at the end of the war. Um, but he didn't know that, and he still joined. So he wasn't there a lot, uh, a long period of time in service. But the fact that he joined, and he joined uh, as a surrogate for someone else. Um, so that is a piece of his history that we talk a lot about um, because uh, it, it's pretty historic because how did he know to come back to Mount Holly? And was he part of the Northern Virginia that had originally marched through Mount Holly on its way to Gettysburg? Is that how he knew to come back to Mount Holly? We don't know. The other piece, and I know I'm rambling here, I want to talk about, this is not the schoolhouse. This, this came out of one of the publications that we have. We were looking for a schoolhouse um, because there was a schoolhouse in the cemetery for the African American community. And we didn't have a picture of it, so we borrowed one from the Historical Society. This is a schoolhouse that was in Dickinson Township, but it's no longer existing. But what we wanted to do is give articles to show that there was a schoolhouse and that it had multi-purpose during the purposes during the course of history. It started out as a schoolhouse, and Kara and I were reading today where they were having some type of meeting there in 1850. 1870, they were having a meeting there, um, but. After it became a, after it wasn't a school, um, it became a um, rental property, and then it later burned down. Um, but we do um, talk about that history. And in the green book, this is a Mount Holly book from the last centennial. In here, there's an article, and Jim Burgess is the one that reminded me of it, um, that says that. In the education system for Mount Holly Springs, any teacher that wanted to teach in Mount Holly had to teach one year at the at the um, African American school in Cedar Street. So see, Jim, I do read your emails. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a list of everyone else that is buried in the cemetery that we know so far. There are 60 graves, we have 51 names. When this was done, um, two are short, of course, when you're finished and it's the signs approved and it's printed and you receive it, you get, you find two more names. Kara sent me two names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lori. Okay, this is just more work in the cemetery. These were first week Dickinson College students that came out to help and that was prior, uh, prior to the fence. This is um, the first step in the ground penetrating radar. Um, to find um, the, the graves in the cemetery. This is Jordan's, Jordan Hayes, and this is her earth science department uh, from Dickinson College. And this, we're very lucky. We have uh, Boy Scouts have been very kind to us. We had an Eagle Scout that finished his project with the help of this gentleman here, and I'll talk about him a little. Um, but we had an Eagle Scout, his name was Derek Wise, who one of the things that the sisters were concerned about is the kids were playing in the graveyard and their parents and, and siblings were buried there. So um, Senator Reagan called us and said, what would you guys need? And we said, how about a fence? So he was very gracious to reach out, not only to obtain the fence for us, but also to find an Eagle Scout that was doing his project. Um, and we have a fence. And, and I point out that this is not a golf jacket. This was St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> um, and again, this, this was in happier times with Edna 
This is Harriet. This is Chief Day, who is also the mayor, uh, not the mayor, Brian's the mayor way back there. Um, he's the chief of police and he's also uh, the borough manager. And then this is Lindsay, David, myself, Pam, and Merle. And Merle lives near the church and you'll go up there and you'll see him on a ladder just doing work and you don't even know that it needed it. One of the other things that uh, you can see how good the cemetery looks. The borough put in a walking pad, put in a parking pad. Um, we do presentations, and we did a presentation at the, uh, for the Sunrise, uh, Sunrise Rotary in Carlisle. And I mentioned that we had gotten a donation from Senator Reagan for a flagpole. And another um, officer that is part of that rotary basically said that a veteran's grave should always have a flag flying over it. And as a result, he donated, the, the Rotary Club donated the balance needed. Um, the borough, we were just going to dig a hole and put it in. That's what Google said you could do. Uh, and then she said, no, you don't do that. And so the borough of Mount Holly Springs, along with the Rotary Club and along with uh, volunteers from Mount Tabor Preservation Project, worked at putting the platform in. And now we have a lovely flag. Um, and we can't, and we, we can't say enough about um, the support that we've gotten and continue to get. This was the exercise of putting in the solar lights, guys. Um, these are volunteers. This is, um, I think, a pro it's one of the professors from Shippensburg. We get volunteers that reach out to us from all over, and um, he emailed and said, "I'd like to, I'd like to help," and I said, "Good." Burn a shovel, we're putting in silver lights. Um, and I remember him because his name is James Edward, and my husband's name is Edward James. So <laughs> it's, it's how things just sort of fall into place. Another story um, the church never had a, an address, it was always called the Color Church on Cedar Street. And so, one of the things when the borough took ownership, we said, Could we get an address? Um, we'd like to have an address. And they said, Sure. So, what we were given by the post office was the number 13 Cedar Street. And somebody said, oh, that's an unlucky number. And I'm like, no, guys, the 13th Amendment is what freed the slaves and indentured, forced indentured servants. So it's like, sometimes you wonder, are we doing the right thing? Are we on the right path? Well, you had a little things like that happen, and you're like, it's a message. It's a song. <laughs> but that's the project we had there. This is when Cumberland County Historical Society presented uh, the Cumberland County Register of Historic Places, uh, and that was Harriet proudly accepting it. And I went, would also like to say on our interpretive signs, that um, video that I played for you, there's a QR code on our interpretive signs because we thought it was always important to have Harriet's voice. Um, as part of the story. If you click on our interpretive sign, or if you go on our website and click on the QR code, you'll be able to see that video. You'll be able to hear Harriet's voice. So Harriet's no longer with us, none of the sisters are. But we still have Harriet's voice. And that's a very good picture. Harriet was a very proud, nobody talked about how old they were, but they were in their 90s. And, um, and that was a, a good day, a good celebration day. As I said, Merle's always there when you go up to your street and Merle's on a ladder doing something for you. <laughs> and there's that pesky little poison island. This is, re these are recent pictures. I'm showing you this because this hole was in the back. Foxes had dug, were looking for a hole at home and they dug their hole. And this hole was flush to the ground. This is what the hole is right here, you can barely see it, but this is much how much space, about two feet below ground level is where the foundation goes. That's how good Goliath did when he was doing that foundation. Um, so this was after they dug it out and power washed it, and this is what it looks like with that hole filled in, and that's what the foundation looks like now. And. Just to remind you, in 2016, when Harriet said, we're concerned about our legacy in our church, this is what it looked like. Mm -hmm. And guys, this is what it looks like today. We want to acknowledge our awards that we've gotten. Um, we were selected by Preservation PA in 2018, uh, and we were put on the at-risk historic site, and that means we stay on that forever. 
And so we're very lucky because we use them as a resource to ask questions um, and suggestions on where to find funding, because guys, we don't have enough money to finish the church, but we're not worried we have the foundation done. Um, this is, we received this in 2017. We're very proud of this from the Cumberland County uh, Historical Society. Uh, and, and this is, in 2021, we were listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And I would like to point out, because I, as Jim sent out an email the other day, Holly Proud, we have two buildings that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places in Mount Holly Springs. Uh, and that's our Amelia S. Gibbons Library. Shout out to the library. And um, we also have uh, Mount Tabor. So we feel that that is um, enough to have people come into our town and hear our history and spend money. <laughs> and this is, thank you, this is a group, and again, not everybody is still with us, but this is a group at the celebration um, when uh, we received our plaque. I wanted to point this out. This person is Roz uh, Gumby, and um, she is the one that was also concerned about the legacy of her family. Her father was Harry Jr. And she did her PhD thesis on her family. This is a, a, the book that she did um, that's been published. And it's Elias and Lucinda Parker, The Case of a Civil War Widow's Pension. And it documents how her great-grandmother, after her husband had died, um, basically went out and petitioned um, the uh, Veterans Administration to receive a pension for her husband that fought in the Civil War. Um, Rosalind died last year, and um, another reason why it's important to capture the stories, because all too often they're gone. So I, I just wanted to, to acknowledge um, Rosalind, uh, because she gave us these books, and we use those as a fundraiser. She also did a Gumby book, um, Parker is older than the Gumby book, but we can't keep the Gumby book because everybody knows the Gumbies, and so they, they like that book better. But the Parker book is basically the piece of history. Um, that's the start of the legacy. So I want to say thank you guys. I hope it wasn't too long. I hope you weren't too bored. And if you have any questions,